locations on a map, and then each day pray for one of them. Pray that God's Word would break through the darkness and bring many to faith in Christ. Pray also that the Word would strengthen believers in their faith and in their courage to proclaim the gospel. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, we would ask that your Spirit would open our eyes to the wonders of your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now as we return back today to the 38th and 39th of Ezekiel, and I'd like to recapitulate some of the things that we said last time that related to these two chapters. First of all, we said that Gog, the land of Magog, and instead of it being the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, it's the prince of Rosh, or the prince of Russia, and Moscow, and Tobolsh, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee. Now we saw that not only the linguistic phenomenon, and as that great scholar, Dean Stanley, wrote in his ponderous tome on the Near East, why he made the statement that this obviously, and he was quoting the seniors, that this is a reference to Russia. And in view of that, he said that Russia was the only modern nation that was mentioned in the Word of God. I wonder why do you think about a crowd today that think they're finding the United States and England in the Old Testament. And of course, that really is far-fetched. But here you have Russia according to the language. Now, not only that, but he's identified geographically. It says you'll come from your place in the north quarters. And three times in these two chapters, the location is given to us. And each time it's in the far north, actually, the uttermost parts of the north. And Russia fulfills that. When you start going north of Israel, why, you will end up in Russia, and when you get through Russia, I want to tell you, you're going to be among the icebergs when you get up there, and you and the polar bears are going to be the only ones there, and maybe a few Russians, I don't know. But here, it's given to us. And then, if that was not enough, we have the philosophical phenomenon, and that is that God, here in no unmistakable terms, and he repeats it, I'm against you. And he says he's going to destroy this nation. These are tremendous statements. And the interesting thing is that this nation, at the time that Ezekiel gave it, had not come into existence. Now, I can understand how he would say that he was against Babylon. And he said he was. But Babylon was in idolatry. And Babylon had taken his people into captivity. He'd used them for that. But as he told Habakkuk, he said, I intend to judge them. I can understand that. But here is a nation not even in existence. And before it comes into existence, God says, I'm going to take them out of existence. Now, that is remarkable. And here, the explanation, I think, is obvious. This is an atheistic nation that has been anti-God from the very beginning. That's their basic philosophy today. And I candidly do not think that they've changed in any way whatsoever. And Plutarch, the Greek, said in his day, said you can find a city that does not have a king. You can find a city that does not have great buildings and many things, but you never saw a city without a religion. Well, today we find that you and I are seeing something never been seen before. God says he intends to judge them. Now he made a statement. He says, I'm going to bring them down into that land. And he makes it clear what land he's talking about. He says that in the latter years that I'm going to bring you down against the mountains of Israel so that we have no misunderstanding here what we're talking about unless we want to say that names of geographical places mean nothing at all or mean what we want them to mean. I think that here Israel means Israel and that we can be sure of one thing, that north is north and north is north of Israel. And it is identified, I think, as Russia. And I think we can say that. Now God says, I will put hooks 
lips in thy jaws, and I'll bring thee forth. Now, that has been interpreted that God was going to put hooks in their jaws when they came down to that land, that he'd lead them out of that land. He'd draw them out, but that's not what he says because he makes it very clear that he intends to judge them in that land and that they're not going to come out of it. He's not going to use a hook to bring them out of that land. Over in verse 11 of chapter 39, it says, It shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel. Now, if he's going to bury them in Israel, obviously he's not going to lead them out of Israel. And he makes it very clear that this is going to be a slaughter, the like of which has not been seen probably in the history of the world. And this is something, therefore, that causes us to go back and What does he mean? He puts hooks into their jaws, and I'll bring thee forth. Well, what he means and what obviously he's saying is, I'm bringing you down into that land, and God says, I'm going to put hooks in your jaws and bring you down into that land. Now, this is a land, therefore, that Israel will be back in at that time. Now, for years, that land was not occupied by them. To tell the truth, after Titus had destroyed that land, why these people were sold into slavery throughout the world, and they were scattered throughout the world. And the land was not a land of milk and honey. We have seen in the book of Ezekiel that even the Negev down there was covered with forest. God said he was going to burn that out. He did. At least there are no trees down there today. And that's the place where this man Elijah went and left his servant, and he kept going on out into the desert, crawled up and under a juniper tree. Well, if Elijah was there today, he'd have trouble finding a juniper tree to crawl up and under. He'd have to find something else. Mark Twain said concerning that land, and I'm quoting him now, Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes, desolate and unlovely. It's a hopeless, dreary heartbroken land. And why should it be otherwise? Can the curse of the deity beautify a land? Palestine is no more of this workday world. It is sacred to poetry and tradition. It's dreamland. Now, it was Dr. Theodore Herzl. He was a playwright in Austria. And he is the man that began this tremendous Zionist movement back to that land. And he made this statement, there's a land without a people. There's a people without a land. Give the land without a people to the people without a land. And so Dr. Wiseman, who was the first president of Israel, he was speaking before the Anglo-American Commission of Inquiry. He says the Jewish nation is a ghost nation. Only the God of Israel has kept the Jewish people alive. And Mr. David Ben-Gurion the premier for many years of that Jewish state, and listen to him. He said, Ezekiel 37 has been fulfilled, and the nation of Israel is hearing the footsteps of the Messiah. Well, they've turned from that now because I have a picture taken when they had their 21st anniversary, I think it was, and there was a great motto in the auditorium there at Tel Aviv, And it was in English and also in Hebrew. And it says, science will bring peace to this land. Well, I thought that the Bible said in the Old Testament that the Messiah would bring peace to the land. So apparently they are chasing a new Messiah today. Now, Russia will come down into that land. That was the belief of Lord Beverly, as we said last time. He made a statement to the press. Russia will not move into Western Europe, but into Asia and the Near East. And he said that General Douglas MacArthur concurred with him in that viewpoint. Well, believe me, their statement made so long ago when everyone thought after World War II that Russia would move into Europe, into Western Europe. They did not move into that area at all, and they have not moved into that area. Now, the situation, I think, is simply this. God says, I'll put hooks in your jaws and bring you down into that land. 
Now, I believe that today we can already see three hooks that God has that he could use to bring them down into that land. Now, number one is this. They're looking for a warm water port, a place for ships. And Russia is moving in this direction. I sat seven years ago in the dining room on the top floor of the Hilton Hotel in Istanbul and watched Russian ships coming out of the Black Sea, moving through the Bosphorus, and headed for the Mediterranean Sea. And that was something that took place after the time that they had the Six-Day War. And after that war, the Russian naval strength increased 40%. And what are they looking for? They're looking for a warm water port. They're moving south. And today, they have a tremendous fleet, and the Admiral Sergei Gorshkov, he's made this statement, and I'm quoting him now. The flag of the Soviet Navy now proudly flies over the oceans of the world. Sooner or later, the United States will have to understand that it no longer has mastery of the seas. They're looking for a warm water port. Where are they going? Well, all I know is they're going where they're going, and they're headed for the Mediterranean. And what nation along the east side of the Mediterranean would be the one that would be suitable? Be the nation Israel. And today, they're very much interested in moving southward. God has put a hook in the jaw. Now, there is a second hook God has there, and that is oil. Today we are being reminded that the world is running short of energy, oil being one of the chemicals that we're running short on. And as a result, the world is turning to where the oil is. The oil is in the Near East, and whether it's in Israel or not is actually not the important thing. The important thing is that a great deal of that oil, in spite of the strained relations between the Arabs and Israel, is coming through that land. And that makes it quite amazing because the ships not being able to get through the Suez Canal put it off at a port that Israel has taken, and then it is pumped across the land of Israel, and it is brought out in Ashdod being one place, and, of course, in Haifa, that was cut off after the Six-Day War, but could be renewed any moment, so that the oil becomes something the world's interested in. As far back as 1955, I brought a message that Russia was hungering for the Arabian oil, that they wanted it. And an editor of a paper in downtown Los Angeles came up to hear the message. He disagreed with it. After that, he made a trip over, and I have here his article, a copy of it, and he said, Russia hungers for Arabian oil. Changed his viewpoint after he'd been over there. Now, the oil reserves go something like this, and I got this from a man that is in research, and he's close to the oil industry, that the total oil reserves in the earth today are estimated at 300 billion barrels, and we're using 6 billion, 400 million barrels a year, and that Russia's oil reserves are 11 billion, 200 million barrels, and the United States has 35 billion barrels in oil reserves. But in the Middle East, the oil reserves amount to 167 billion barrels. Well, there's over three times as much oil there as the United States and Russia combined have. Apparently, that's a pretty good hook God's got in the jaws because any modern nation today is going to have to have oil, and that's where it is today. Now, the third hook we'd like to mention is the Dead Sea. In the Dead Sea, there is untold wealth in chemicals that are in saturation, 
in the water there. And it's also a place where men are looking today. It's estimated that the Dead Sea contains 2 billion tons of potassium chloride, which is potash. And it's certainly needed today to sweeten up and enrich the soil that's being depleted in many areas, including our own. And that's only one. There's 22 billion tons of magnesium chloride. And then there is 6 billion tons of calcium chloride. And there are others, cesium, cobalt, manganese, are there as well, actually, as gold. And believe me, friends, that effort is being made today to get it out. Now, if you had been around oh, a few million years ago, and you would have seen the Lord forming this earth and fixing this place there, the Dead Sea, you would probably have asked him, well, what are you doing there, damming up that sea? Why, well, you're going to have a pretty salty place. Or he would have said, I'm baiting a hook. And you would have said, baiting a hook for what? He said, well, there's going to be coming down here in a few million years a nation up north, and I'm going to bring them down. <laughs> so I'm just baiting my hook now a little ahead of time. And that's what God's been doing. He's been baiting a hook. Now, they're coming down. And the question is, when are they coming down? Well, here is where so many expositors disagree. There are some that believe that at the end of this age, that is where we are today, before the church leaves, they'll come down. There are others that believe that he'll come down at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, others at the end, and there are some believe that he'll come down at the beginning of the millennium. Now, I'm not going into these different viewpoints. The only thing that I want to say today is that my particular viewpoint is that he comes down in the latter days, and these latter days, as we've seen in the other prophets, and it becomes a technical term, it specifically refers to the Great Tribulation period. Now, I won't go into detail now about this, but when Antichrist comes to power, he's going to come to power on a peace platform. He's going to promise peace, prosperity, and everything that the world wants today. And as a result, why, there will be a false peace. In the midst of that Tribulation period of seven years, there will be a peace, the first part. Then Russia will come down from the north, and I believe this is it. Now, what will the result be? In chapter 39, verse 2, I read, And I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts. Now, where it says, I'll leave but a sixth part of thee, the literal is, I will six thee, or better still, I will send a pestilence, or six plagues upon you. Now, what are they? Well, back in verse 22 of chapter 38, God says, I will enter into judgment against him, and here the six are, pestilence, blood, and then we have here an overflowing rain, and then great hailstones, the fourth, and then fire is five, and then brimstone is six. Now, those are the judgments. Now, why did God ever give to us the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? Just to let you and me know how he's going to judge these people. How did he destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, he did it with brimstone, we're told, that they rained upon the city, hail, and fire and brimstone. And that's exactly the way God intends to destroy this army that will be coming out of the north against his people to destroy them. And you must remember that Russia has always been anti-Semitic from the very beginning. And today, I suppose outside of the land of Israel in this country, the largest number of Jews are yonder in Russia, and they're having a problem today of getting them out. Now, they will come down. God says that they will. This is the way that he'll destroy them. Now, that has a message for me, and I want to say it rather hurriedly, but I want to say it, this. When God was ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham thought God was being unjust. And he said, if there are 50, 40, 30, 20, or there are 10 people there, 
Why didn't he come on down to one? Because he thought Lot absolutely was not God's child, but he was. And did you know that God said to Lot, you get out of this city. I can't destroy it as long as you are here. I do not believe God will or can let the tribulation come till he gets his church out of the world, and that's the picture. And here we are given that information. This is a tremendous passage of Scripture, friends. You know, people don't read Ezekiel much these days, do they? Well, we'll be in it next time and maybe two more times. Then we'll return to the New Testament. Until next time, may God richly bless you.